Welcome, welcome, internet people. It's your boy, Sean. <laughs> My name's Sean. I host the Advent of Computing podcast, and I just finished up a new script for my upcoming episode. I have some downtime, so it's going to take a nice little break before I get back to doing more scripting and have some pl- a little bit of fun playing video games. But it, it has to be on theme since, you know, I host a show about computer history. I kind of can't escape that world. So this is the wonderful world of Plato, which, if you've never heard of it, then you are not alone. It's a very interesting system. Um, I have to remember my login. So Plato was this system of networked terminals that was developed at the University of Illinois starting in the 1960s. And it really started picking up steam in the 1970s once they moved to larger installations. The initial goal of Plato was to automate teaching. So the idea was there's a glut of students after World War II and it's just getting worse and worse. And there's just not enough teachers to teach everyone. And it's known already at this time that one-on-one teaching is kind of the way you want to go. So the problem becomes... How do you do one-on-one or close to one-on-one teaching if there are way too many students? The answer is you kind of can't. So what they tried to figure out was a way to automate teaching, Um, which it's not in the same sense that we'd have totally online classes today. The idea was to offer some courses that were computerized. This originally started in the 1960s with very limited technology, which I don't fully understand how they would make it work because they had to do all kinds of tricks like using small kind of network terminals and CCTV feeds to try to share computing resources among students and somehow distribute slides and whatnot to all these terminals so that they could teach lessons. And eventually it turns into a very large system. By the 70s, they're using basically supercomputers to run time-sharing systems that service, I think at max they had a few thousand terminals. And what's wild about these terminals is, one, they're networked, and two, they have graphics displays. They have very early gas plasma displays. And putting them in a little bit in colleges, mainly in high schools, Um, or at least a lot of the people, a lot of the students that would end up doing wild things with these were in high school originally. Some very cool stuff starts happening on the system. I need to actually log in now because it keeps timing me out. Um, So right now I'm using this software called P-Term, which is a Plato terminal emulator that I have connected up to Cyber One which is a website and a wonderful project that's running an emulated Plato mainframe. Um, the only frustrating thing about this is one of the quirks about Plato is they had a custom keyboard. Well, it wasn't really custom. There wasn't super hard and fast standards. There, rather, there weren't super hard and fast standards for keyboards when Plato started. So they just had a keyboard developed just for these terminals, which means they have keys on them that don't line up with modern day keyboards. So I need to do that. All right. So hammering away on my keyboard, I kind of have to read and do annoying multi key commands to use this system. Um, So what I'm alluding to here is once Plato gets into the hands of students, they start making video games and they start making early network software. The actual data networking, how that worked on Plato is a little weird. They used least telephone lines to send data around. Um, It's kind of like a modem. Well, it is a modem, but they're using a different kind of protocol. Once data got, once they connected up to the mainframe, there was this idea of shared data pools between users So if you're logged into a lesson, which is what Plato calls a program because this is teaching software, then you could have this shared data space 
with other users that were also logged in. I, I don't remember the exact purpose. By conjecture and fuzzy memory, it's been a while since I've actively researched this and read about it. I think that was mainly meant as a way to do facilitate, facilitate classroom discussion and kind of live workflows, but it ends up being used for video games and strangely enough, things like forums. So anyway, this is what you get when you log in. It's kind of bare bones, just asks you to choose a lesson. Um, the help that's available, that's another interesting thing about Play-Doh is since it's meant for students, there's a lot of help facilities. Um, this wasn't just supposed to be purely, hey, you're on your own, kid. The idea was there would be lessons and there would be a mechanism for students to go, well, I need some help on this lesson. So you might be taking a quiz on it, you fail a question, and it says, hey, you can answer again or you can get some help. So most programs that you run are lessons will have a help file or some interactive, quote-unquote, interactive help facility. Um, that doesn't help us here, though, because you still need to know the lesson you want to run. It's For the 1970s, this is a really, really cool user interface. It's really slick, but it's not what we'd expect to use today. Luckily, on Cyber One, they have a menu called Big Jump, which is it's basically just a directory of lessons that are available. Also, if you ever want to toy around with this, you can get an account on Cyber One. Now, if you're a little savvy, set up the emulator and connect it up. Um, it's not an automated process. You have to submit a form and someone has to manually um, assign you a login. It's pretty quick. I think I got mine in like a week. And also, if you want to learn more about Play-Doh in general, the there's kind of one de facto book on the subject. It's called The Friendly Orange Glow by Brian Deere. And it's a really good read that's very comprehensive on the history of the system. And like I was saying, Plato is relatively obscure. Um, so there's really only that one book. That's the majority of scholarship. Um, the author did a really good job of interviewing a lot of the people that were involved firsthand with Plato's development. So, excuse me, there's really nothing like it out there. It's there's a handful of different topics like that in computing history, and Plato happens to be one where there's one de facto source. Anyway, we're not talking very in-depth about the history of Plato. What I want to show you are the games that were on Plato, because that's where I, I think stuff gets really wild. So keep in mind, we're in the 1970s. So we have a simple gas plasma display. It's actually the first practical gas plasma display that was ever made. So it's a bit of a big deal, but at the same time, you, you can see the pixels. This isn't super high resolution by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and also importantly, it's not bitmapped or it's not the software that accesses it. You don't have bitmap level access, so you can't plot individual pixels. It's still technically text-based, but it's a pixel display on the hardware, if that makes sense. So all of these games have to get around that by switching out custom font sets. And that actually works really effectively. I think this program, Big Jump, is just using the default font set because if memory serves, it's similar to ASCII where you have all the normal alphanumeric stuff you could want, but then you also have these drawing characters um, that you can use to make this nice interface. And then also, as you can see with stuff that's underlined and whatnot, there are facilities to change the, uh, the attribute. That's the word. The attribute on certain font sections on the screen. So it, if you're familiar with ASCII and how the PC text modes work, it's kind of like that, except there's some caveats that make it more useful. So anyway, I want to load up a video game. Um, in Big Jump, how that works, oh, I have to remember. So everything's keyboard driven. There wasn't a mouse. So I think it's capital G. No, I, okay, I need to go back on the list. This is like I was saying, the Play-Doh keyboards, you can find images of them online. They're kind of weird. They're like a 60% keyboard almost with special buttons. So, 
press G to run, and I want to run two. Oh man, this is why this is titled Failing at Mainframe Games. I work with computers daily. I'm not that good at using computers. Um, anyway, this will be a short stream if I can't load the game. So I'm on the game list. Is it J? Oh, it is J to jump. Okay. That's why it's called Big Jump. Um, so it's a choose your number kind of interface. The first game I want to show you is Adventure, which this is, if I got the right one, which I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah, I want to save the lesson. All right, so this I'm pretty sure is a mud, which actually isn't that interesting. So I'm trying to remember, I think Moria is the really Good one. Um, I gotta find that though. Luckily this is alphabetic. Oh, actually, no, this will work. Let's do Empire. Oh man, I lost the number. Failing at computers yet again. Okay, we want number 46, Empire. Here we go. So this is gonna be more emblematic of the kind of pushing of technology that was happening. Empire's an MMO. And by that, I mean, Massive here is like 32 people, but it is an online multiplayer game. And even more importantly, it has graphics. So, Okay, that's control in. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna make use of the help file. Let's see, I think, there it is. So with the keyboard, they have a dedicated help key. On the mapping for the emulator, it's control H. Um, so Empire is based off Star Trek. You play as a starship captain on different teams. There's four. Federation, Klingon, Ferengi, and I think Orion. You go around and you try to essentially claim planets on a map. There's ship-to-ship -ship combat. You can bombard planets and you can land people on planets. And then you also have things like fuel and resource controls you have to manage. Um, you can send distress signals if you're damaged. Basically, you, you have to do everything that they did on the original TOS, it, at least the the aggression part. You don't get to explore flora and fauna as much. Um, but once again, it's just a keyboard, so it's all key commands. Um, so I'm trying to remember what the one to alter course is. I believe, yeah, it is K. So I want to zoom out. <laughs> so changing speed is the zero through one, K is changing the course, that's in radians. And then what's the zoom again? It's not Z, that'd be too easy. You can de declare war and peace, set times, yada yada. Orbit planets, okay, M's the one for map. And then, okay, it's five, seven, nine. So, New heading. Oh yeah, it is in degrees. Warp eight. So this might actually be kind of boring because I don't think anyone else is in the game right now. So then maybe, hmm, maybe a better demo would be Moria. Yeah. Anyway, the, the idea here is if this was Populated, you could do combat. And if I was better at games, you could do combat. Um, that's the one thing that you can't really replicate with an emulator is the community on these systems. So you kind of don't get to see the cool part of the MMOs, if that makes sense. Um, but I think... Where's Future War? That should be... There it is. Jump to 51. 
So this is going to be another example of the wild graphics that show up on Play-Doh. Well, you know, wild as in functional, passable for 1970s. Um, as you can see, there's a great use of the alternate character set. Future War is a first-person shooter written using only text characters and fancy alternate character sets on a networked computer in the 1970s. It's, we're beaming into the future right now. It's set in the not-so-distant future after some type of nuclear war. This is the same kind of deal as Space War, where, not Space War, uh, too many war games. Um, the same deal as Empire, where it is an MMO, kind of. You can, if other people are on, you can run into other time travelers in the dungeon. So this currently has one time traveler, which is me. So we're not going to get to see that, which is sad. But so I want to play as let's do an American since we're in America. That sounds fine. Quiz H. I want to be a hunter. I think that means you get more gun power. So the other thing with Play-Doh is a lot of the people who developed video games on the system were massive D&D nerds. So usually there, there's a bunch of D&D implementations on here. Um, and there's also a whole lot of fancy, fancy classing systems um, that kind of mimic D&D. And there's also random chance in most of these games. So they have a very D&D feel, at least mechanics-wise. Um, this one is a little different since it has guns. <laughs> so I'm going to check the help file because I need that. Okay, let's see. I need... Do, do, do. Keys and term help. Okay. W80. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is basically WAST. So that should be fine. Um, join, I think, is for joining teams. So in a lot of these D&D-inspired games, you can join teams and parties to venture out into the dungeon. Just the idea being that you travel and play together. L for flashlight, message, that stuff doesn't matter. But what's important is move, shoot, which is S. Very nice. W-A-S-D, kind of. Um, here, I think, is just look around. You can choose weapon, equip weapon. That's fine. So this is kind of similar to hack um, or rogue, which is easy. Okay. So, and then I think doors and everything are auto. So let's get into it. Do, do, do. Next. Oh man, I bailed out of it. Oh, this is the danger of not having a Play-Doh keyboard, which I don't think anyone has outside a museum. Um, so one of the fun things with the keyboard is there's a dedicated stop key, which just dumps you to the menu. Anyway, next. Okay. Entering the future. Press next to play. There we go. Now we are in the beautiful graphics. <laughs> um, so one of the really interesting things about Play-Doh is the computer, the terminals don't actually have that much memory. So I forget the exact numbers, but I remember it being diminutive. Oh man, I might just die from radioactive waste. Um, the reason that they don't have a lot of memory is because in the 70s and historically in general, computer memory has been prohibitively expensive. Which, you know, that's a good reason not to have memory in your massively networked stack. 
because you, you'll run out of budget pretty quick. That's a closed door. Stop running! Um, so instead of having memory, they kind of went wild with the technical side of things. So that's the reason that they ended up using a gas plasma display. And the reason they have the first gas plasma display is because, okay, shoot. We are in combat now with a mutant. Um, so a gas plasma display is interesting because it has a certain level of memory built into it. It's a hysteresis effect that has to do with the physical characteristics of plasma. Um, the physics are cool. They don't really matter. All that matters is if you have a refresh cycle going and a certain charge applied to your plasma, it can stay in an on state, which makes it glow. And then if you dump, dump down below um, the certain level, then it turns off, which would be a dark pixel. Yeah, I'm out of weapons and out of time. So I, I think I die. Um, what's, what makes that useful is since these screens are essentially memory, you don't need to store a buffer for your display. So most of the stuff is rendered, or well, kind of rendered, on the supercomputer that these connect up to. In this case, the good people at Cyber One are running an emulator for us. Um, yeah, I died because I ran out of power. So they rendered out on a mainframe and then they blit the data out to your terminal, which just plops it down into the screen. Because of that, you don't have to have a buffer on your side. And also on the mainframe side, um, once everything's been figured out and they know what pixels to send, they can just send it and forget it. They don't need to store a whole lot of RAM to keep track of what's on everyone's screen. And like I was saying, that's a cost reduction that is only possible because of how gas plasma displays work. It's a really cool example of the technology working exactly how you want it within your constraints. So because of that, you can get kind of complex graphics, but there's limits to how much stuff you can have on the screen that updates quickly. There's a certain refresh cycle, let's be a cyborg this time, um, that goes on on the back end. So because of that, you can't update constantly. You have to kind of pick and choose, which means that a lot of these could probably render a fake 3D image pretty large, at least covering a large portion of the screen. But the developers chose to do a small portion of the green screen specifically because it makes rendering faster. There's, excuse me, there's us data, so it's easier to render. I'm just gonna go through that. And I died. Oh man. So that that's the beautiful randomness in this game is since damage is randomized and hitting and missing is randomized, you can just die. I think the mutants are immune to radioactive waste. So I'm gonna try that next. Um, the other thing with a lot of these video games on Play-Doh is they're hard as nails. The reason for that just being kind of how games were regarded at the time. Um, there's not really save files. One of, if you read the Friendly Orange Glow, one of the things that keeps coming up time and time again is since a lot of the developers didn't have like an admin account. They had a lower privilege access account. They had file quotas. So because of that, there is a lot of work done to use as little, um, as little file storage as possible. So some of these have saved games. Not many of them do. I believe, 
I'm trying to think if Future War does. I'm, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Um, I know some of them let you kind of checkpoint save. Man, I gotta find out how to open those doors. I'm sure there's a button for it. Um, Future War doesn't do checkpoint saves. So, if you're not saving and not having a really massive game world with, you know, a whole lot of depth, then it makes sense to have them be more difficult because that way it's about kind of upping your skill um, and, you know, playing over and over again to get better and better. W's move through door. Wait, oh, shift W? Ugh. Um, break in fails. Anyway, the point I was getting to is these aren't very easy games to play all the time, especially for modern sensibilities. And there's a lot of great accounts of students who got into these games basically in some cases, breaking into labs where Play-Doh terminals were so that they could, you know, grind out a few levels late at night when no one else was using them. Because you have to remember that these are still meant as an educational platform. So even though they have fun, wild, freaky games, you're supposed to be using them to learn. And no one was actually doing that. Or some people were doing that, but the interesting stuff that's recorded wasn't um, that. <laughs> Ew, sewage. All right, this is a level I haven't gotten to before. I know that <laughs> playing this, this is... Oh, I'm dead. Darn it. This is something that I would have really, really gotten into in high school. I used to play a whole lot of NetHack and Rogue and those types of games, and this would be right up my alley. Um, now, though, it's challenging and frustrating. <laughs> All right, I want to make another run. I have a... I feel like I can get further into the game. The... The other thing, going back to what I was saying, where you can't emulate a community, a lot of these game systems have the ability to chat with other players, but there's also a built-in um, function in Play-Doh where you can send an instant message to another user on the system. So if I haven't actually seen screenshots of it or seen it working in practice because there's not a whole lot of people using these servers at once, but from what I understand, the, on the bottom of the screen, you could instant message someone and it would show up with a quick text that you could respond to, which I think would be neat. This is definitely, like I keep saying, this is the kind of system that I know I would have used back in the day if I was exposed to it. Um, this was the latest and greatest because it it does everything that we do on the internet, really. It's kind of a microcosm where it has educational facilities for research a la actual lessons. I'm just going to go down. Um, but it also has a way to communicate with users. It has video games to play. It has all these other kind of time wasty, but also um, just kind of fun things to do. It's a place for a community to form. Am I totally in the dark? No. That's the other thing is the render distance on these can be screwy. Oh man, way too dark. I'm curious why I haven't ran into any monsters yet. The other fun thing with Future War is, and with a lot of these games, is they're built as mazes, but what's that say? Sally Rom. 
Um, but there aren't maps in game. Hey, a first aid kit. That's not useful right now. So you kind of just get stuck in it. And that kind of goes back to how a lot of these games are difficult and they're main, meant to be binged kind of where you play repeatedly over and over and it just takes up all your attention. Um, so I imagine, here we go, here's a mutant. This is the kind of thing where drawing a map, and I'm dead. <laughs> drawing a map would help a lot. So would finding more weapons, but you know, all right, I'm gonna exit out of this and go back to big jump. Like I keep alluding to, games weren't the only thing on here. There are, as you can see on big jump, um, miscellaneous and note files, which are something that I find particularly interesting. Uh, like I was saying, Plato had the facilities to do instant messaging between users it had something very similar to email called personal notes where you could send notes to and from folk on the system for, you know, to pick up afterwards. Um, that's actually one of the kind of interesting things about email in general. I did an episode in October about the development of email systems and it's the kind of thing that just kind of shows up on its own in a vacuum once you have folk that are on a time-shared system like Play-Doh sharing hardware, you run to a situation where you can talk to people now. So systems for doing that show up a lot. And so originally the note system in Play-Doh was just some open files that anyone could access and people would send information to each other through those. But over time it turned into a fully fledged program. Um, this though is slightly different. This is just note files, which are forums. So I think one's admin or anime. I can't remember. Um, let's go with DT Cyber. I think that's the one about the actual system. So as you can see, it's basically a forum. Um, it's pretty similar to like, Back in the day, if you ever used a BBS or even like a BB forum, I think is one of the generic open source projects that's still in use online, you're kind of familiar with it. There are different boards and each board has topics with responses. Um, number nine, Cybus release looks like it has some information. As you can see, it's not very well traveled, which is a shame. I wish more people were on this system because it's really interesting. Um, and there's cool old video games on here. Um, anyway, so that's nine. So it loads up and that that's kind of one of the weird things about the forum implementation and the note implementation in general on Play-Doh is it loads up in a full window, which, I mean, there, there's not really a concept of windows, um, but there's no menu items on here except help available. And that goes back to the custom keyboard because there's keys for next, stop, help, I think back. Um, I think there was one other. Anyway, there, there's custom key control, so you don't need a menu on the screen as much because you know, oh, to go to the next note, you hit next. So yeah, there's, like I was saying, this is another kind of thing where it kind of sucks that there's not a larger community um, using this constantly because that just means we don't get to see that part emulated. All right, but let's see. Let's see what other fun games are on here. If I remember, Moria is another one. Oh, there's Avatar. I remember that. So Avatar is number eight. Just the, the sheer amount of software that Cyber One's been able to preserve still boggles the mind to me. Um, I know when I was doing my series of episodes on Play-Doh, there's quite a few primary sources, but I'm not 
I hate to reach out to Cyber and talk to them because I'm curious how they did all their archival work. Um, I don't know if they got like disk images or had to scrounge up software printouts. All right. So if I remember right, if memory serves, um, Avatar is another D&D emulator kind of game. As we can see, here's a character sheet. Um, like I was saying, there's a lot of random chance in these kinds of games. So I believe this is the kind of thing that auto rolls your sheet for you. So right now I'm an ogre male. And next, or maybe not next, let's look at the help menu. Oh, that's cool. I didn't, that's kind of just funny seeing the help pop up onto the same interface as your status. All right, message, track, untrackable, leave company, pick up, drop, use item, use power, use item, use spell. Oh yeah, lab and copy. And, yeah, lab and copy are the only other keys. And the one is one of the modifier keys. So like lab one would be the one modifier in lab. I believe I might be wrong. Like I was saying, it's been probably more than a year since I actually used this system. Okay, so it looks like I can go T for dungeon. Oh man, that's right. So this is another interesting thing about Avatar is this is the play window. So, you know, it's small. The kind of saving grace here is that means you can have the help menu up. Um, how do I kill the skeleton that's threatening me? Or, sorry, the zombie that's threatening me. Um, fight? I don't have a weapon. Run. Well, I think I just die. Okay, let's kill that and try it again. Big jump. All right. Oh, doy. Enter doesn't really matter on this system. Back to Avatar. Next. You are dead. Okay, so I guess this did save state, and it saved state of me being dead. Next. You are dead. Okay, um, do, do, do. What's the button? Eh, maybe I do just need to read more. All right, shift back. So yeah, this is one of the things that is kind of a roguelike before rogue, I guess, or this would be roughly contemporary to Rogue. So that's neither here nor there. As near as I can tell, there wasn't a direct influence between the two. Man, why? Okay, go next. Wait for someone to carry you or resurrect you or shift back and delete your character. Shift back. Data was another special key, that's right. Well, let's go with the help. Help me. Basic character info. Oh no, this is just about the actual system. I'm gonna figure this out. Oh, that's right. Uh, so, I can't type today. Um, big jump. The accounts that you're given on Plato nowadays, or on Cyber One, rather, are author accounts, which means you can edit some files if you have the passwords. 
for them. That's what I was talking about when I mentioned that back in the day, there were limited file quotas, so people were stingy about files, and that was because a lot of them didn't have um, admin rights, so they didn't have... It was hard to get an author account, um, and you had to have one to program, but if I remember right, there are different levels of author accounts with different amounts of data they could have. Go to stat lesson, go to note file. It must be lab for character options. Yep, it is. Data to delete. I don't want a password. Man, I broke it again. <laughs> oh, I am not good at computers, guys. All right, let's do it again. Jump to avatar. I'll figure this out because I, I'm a computer whiz. Okay, shift back. I was on the right menu. Lab. I need to delete your character and destroying essence now. All right, create character. That's me. Oh, transfer character from? Eh. Next. All right. I want to be, let's be an ogre. Oh yeah, that's right. You have to allocate stats. That's not an uptown thing. That's annoying. Um, let's do 20 strength. One intelligence. Okay. Three intelligence. Wisdom. 20 constitution. 20 charisma. Oh, 18 charisma. Five plus six is what? 11 dexterity. Data. I want to be good. I want to be male. Same pseudonym. Shift next to attempt to store. Born again. So, something that I don't know, and I should know, because I'm curious about it, is how they handled, um, excuse me, how they handled save state data and private data on Plato. There had to have been a private store of files for non-admin users, but I forget the specifics. I should reread that book. Um, all right, so I need the help file. Bank, morgue, general store. Let's go to the general store and buy a sword. Buy an item. I have 500 gold. Oh wait, no, I want a hammer. Get a war hammer. Ooh. I don't have that much money. Lab to buy, unusable. All right, let's go back. Sword. Is there an axe? Axe of power? What can I buy for 500 gold? Sword of slang. Sure. Cheap sword. Okay, buy, listing usable items only. Let's get an axe. Unusable. <laughs> oh man, these are annoying. Okay, help. Bank, guild, spell, dungeon. Back to the general store. I still need a weapon. 
Okay, so buy item. Data. Oh, there is. Okay, shift next to see item. Plate mail, steel mail, adamantine mail. Ooh. And I think the U, G, N, E, that must be the item rating. So uncommon, good, super good, but spelled with an N, and exceptional would be my guess. Well, there's some information. Still not seeing a sword, but I guess I should buy some mail, probably some iron mail. So let's try that. good at this that's the other thing is these interfaces without a mouse are kind of limiting at least to our modern conception okay let's do this again by listing usable items shift next to see items leather armor cloak leather boots leather cap hey that's closer that's more like it for me Leather armor. I can afford that. Hey, hey. Okay, back, back. And then I want to, what's the button for equip? Those are weapon things. Yell, track, move, untrackable, pick up, drop, use item. It's gotta be use item, right? Capital U, item number two. Hey, look at that. I am now wearing my leather armor. I'll go back to the general store. There has to be... Yeah, there's still nothing. Oh well. Um, I guess let's venture forth and try to find a better store. T for dungeon. Wait, okay. City, all right. Well, that could be good. Let's look at the general store. <laughs> you list. Sure, I guess I'll buy some boots. That is ambiguous, isn't it? Leather boots. Yeah, oh. Pressed back instead of lab. All right, then you, no. Back, back, use number three. Help general store, you sword. Oh, that's still so expensive. Maybe there are just no items I can buy. Oh well. Okay, back to the dungeon. What's the thing to go through a door? Nope. Okay, I'm getting killed by a goblin. But since I don't have a weapon, I die. <laughs> oh man. Let's try something else. Big jump. Let's try ad game. Let's just go down the list. What's number one? An orange bar? Who would have thought? Oh, I get it. There must be some text that got messed up. This is a lesson plan, isn't it? 
Um, let me see. There are view options. I might be able to change session settings. No, I don't think I can. Well, so much for that. Big jump. Arrow games. Let's try air fight. That sounds fun. What could that be? I know there's a few flight sims on the game somewhere. All right. Try to improve the range and takeoff of performance of a light airplane. Final design of a VTOL airplane. Let's try number three. Let's launch a spacecraft to one of the planets. No. The planets Earth and Mars are shown below with the circular orbits around the sun. Next, the angle between Mars and Earth here is 120.0 degrees. Path between the planets that requires the least amount of fuel is an elliptical path tangent to both orbits and with one focus on the sun, a space vehicle's path and the engineer's calculate orbit. Okay. Now launching. Okay, so it shows the orbit and then I'm assuming the actual game part is going to be choosing when to launch. Yeah, you need to tell the engineers when to launch the space vehicle by giving them the power, the proper angle Mars must have. Okay. Let's go to Mars. The other thing about the text inputs in this game, or in this game, in Plato in general, that's interesting is they're designed to be kind of user friendly. So a lot of them do kind of fuzzy matching, if that makes sense, where they're smart enough to figure out what you mean by like simple natural language guessing. Um, obviously that won't work all the time, but some of the times it makes it a little bit easier to do stuff. Okay, try and land the space vehicle on the planet. Angle in degrees. Let's try 90. Boom. Starting positions are shown. Next to launch or A to change the angle. Let's do it. Bum, 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 ba -dum. Oh man, still short. Heavens to NASA, you've lost an expensive space probe. All right, so it has to be less than 90. Is it zero? It might be zero. Let's try zero. All right. Bum, 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 bum. 60 degrees. You missed, it'll be a long trip home. <laughs> That's funny, 30. I should know this. I have an astrophysics degree. This can't be that far from my career goal. Oh man. So it has to be like, what, 35? This is interesting though as a lesson because it's not so much showing you the equations, it's just having you guess around. So I wonder, I wonder what the point of this lesson then was. Um, let's start 40. I think I'm zeroing in on this. So this seems more like it was just meant to expose students to the idea um, of what's involved here. It must be 45 then. Okay, 45, go to Mars. I mean, obviously it's entertaining enough that I keep Entering guesses. What, your timing was off? You're close. The plant leads the vehicle by 1.26 degrees. You can do decimals? That changes every, everything. So it must be 45 or 46.25. Let's try that. 46.25. Do it. Now launching. 
Bum, 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 bum. And. Oh, less. So 44 point. Oh man, I gotta do math. I'm not good at math anymore. <laughs> Let's see. 46.25 minus 2.51, 43.74. Let's try that. 43.74. I wonder if it just has a little message or it does a fun animation when you win. All right, here we go. Congratulations. And look, the graphic is the same as when I was off by a few degrees. <laughs> That's annoying. Oh, level two? Try to return the vehicle to Earth from the planet. Well, let's try 50 degrees. That can't be right. Is it? No. Another step backwards for mankind. That's a little cruel. 60. It must be once you get within either 5 or 10 degrees, it gives you the difference. Sixty-five. Next. Now launching your spacecraft. Oh, oh, that looks close. Ah. 75. Let's try that now. All right, getting closer. There we go. Earth leads vehicle by 1.29 degrees. So 76.29. Oh, I hope I don't have that backwards again. 76.29. Well, I guess I'll find out now. Now, launching. All right, it's getting close. And congratulations, made it back to Earth. And that's the game. <laughs> you get a flight plan, that's funny. Okay, so I, I get it. It's kind of a simple lesson plan, but I like it, that's effective. Mercury's orbit is too elliptical for this simulation. This isn't a simulation. This is a yes or no. I want to see what Venus does. I'm not going to play through the whole thing, but I'm just curious. Next. So it's just going to be the same as the Mars trip, but backwards. Okay, I get it. And then we'll have some factoids about Venus's orbit if you win. Okay. Onward to big jump. All right, let's jump to bingo. No. What is bagels? That sounds fun. Maybe it'll make some bagels for me. Last winner was a pirate. This is a game of bagels. I, I still think this just makes bagels. The idea of the game is to guess a, guess a three-digit number that I'm... Oh, it's like Mastermind. For each of your guess, I will tell you more the following. Fermi, Pico, bagels. I'm not good at these. <coughs> Excuse me. One, two, three. Oh, man, I gotta remember... Digits must be unique. Two, three, one. One, three, two. Three, two, one. Two, one, three. Yeah, I can't figure this out. Data, I give up. The number was 136. 
Yep, no, I'm done with that. Nope, nope, nope. Um, I am not good at guessing games because I have no imagination or reasoning skills. Lost those when I got my degree. Bees. Let's see what bees are. Or bees is. Ugh. Be have. The rules. Hi, I'm Sean. How many bees do you want? That's an odd question. Let's try two to start with. You have two bees in all. Press O to let out bees. Let B put the B back in. Press X to turn on the X-ray. Turn on the X-ray, turn off the X-ray. What is this? I can X-ray the bees and let them in and out. Very fancy. <laughs> There's two bees in the hive. That is good. This must be a number guessing game for kids or something. Press next. Let two bees out. Out, out. There are zero bees in the hive. I wonder if you could say none. Oh, okay. You have to do a number. Turn off the x-ray. There's one B in. Oh, I have two bees in the hive. This is such a weird game. <laughs> oh man, I lost one problem. I'm gonna leave. I am intimidated by bees. Let's try bicycles. Or biorhythm's probably just biorhythm. Let's try bicycles though. I'm curious if that's a card game. Your good days, oh, biocycles, I can't read with a darn. Your good days and your bad days, as foretold by the phases of the natural biorhythmic cycles. Yeah, let's do it. What year were you born? Oh man, I'm gonna be showing my age. So yeah, I, I'm only 25, don't tell anyone. Oh man, N noon? Let's go with noon. Sure. Next. All right, let's see today's reading. Boop, boop, boop. All right, the brackets on each chart indicate the range of level of each biorhythmic cycle for the period beginning at midnight on this day ending 24 hours later. Is that this midnight or last midnight? <laughs> Oh man, I, I don't get what this means. This is mumbo jumbo. I'm gonna back out. Let's go back to big jump. I wonder if biorhythm is better than. Oh wait, no, this is a lesson. <laughs> oh man, hey. 23 day physical cycle represents each 23 days. It depicts your energy, vitality, strength. Oh man, here we go. 28 day emotional cycle. Oh, and but a 33 day intellectual cycle. High and low days are halfway between. Okay, they're, they're sinusoidal. Critical day, critical days. Yeah, all right, I'm learning. Assuming your cycles start at birth. That's a weird assumption, but, you know, whatever. This seems so weird. Where's the founding for this? That, is that it? No, okay. Are you ready to enter your birth date? Okay. As, oh man. Oh, 30, 1995. Enter end date. 
Ooh, do, do I have an end of my date? Let's do 1201, 1201 2020. Sure. Thirty ninety five one no. Nope. I see that isn't something compliant. <laughs> I don't know if that's even Y two K compliance or just me not knowing how to use a computer. It's probably both. Both. How about brain? That sounds like something I could use some more. Uh, the brain buster. Oh no, this is another guessing game. <laughs> oh please no. How hard of a game? Can I do one? Apparently it's two to nine. Next equal ready. Lab surrender. Um, what? <laughs> Help. No, that's too big brained for me apparently. <laughs> well, the computer won. <laughs> What is Camelot? That sounds like a video game. Sweeping dungeons. Oh, is this a dungeon crawl? The, the one thing I'm curious about is I haven't seen any top-down games on this yet. Don't know if there's a reason for that. If it might be the screen size restrictions. But let's see what we got. Oh, I guess I played this before. Okay, I'm dead and rotting. Perfect. <laughs> I can keep hitting shift enter. Rested for 92 days. Okay, so this must be another dungeon crawl. Boop, boop, boop. Come on, buddy. Man, I gotta wait. Oh, I get it. I have to wait for my health. All right. What's the help? Level item, item, bank, make, level, store, treasure pickup, quest. Man, that's too complicated. So, Camelot, another D&D &D clone. That's fine. Carol quest, Cyril quest? Number 21? Let's see what that is. C-E-R-L quest. Create a record, check note file, high score. Let's, let's get some information. Your task will define five LEDs. There are two red ones, two green ones, and one yellow one hidden somewhere nearby. This must be a newer one. So I know that eventually... Plato starts to use color plasmas, but that's not until much later. So I wonder, I wonder what the deal with this one is. This might be a more recent game. Well, recent. Might be 1980s. Who knows? A, I have died. <laughs> or rather, the game has died. That's the other thing, is some of this just... Software just doesn't work, which isn't that surprising, I guess. This is an old system. Chai volts. Oh, I wonder if that's a circuit simulator. One way to find out, right? 24. Here we go. Oh, high volts. The game of electric fences. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I love the lightning bolt. This is great. The object of this game is to survive. Anywhere on the 10 by 10. Okay, so this is a top down. Press the arrow keys. If you moved into the electric fence, you will be zapped. If Mo moves in, you will be zapped. You can also press J to jump to a random place. 
Okay. You must move once every three seconds, or the mows will move anyway. So it sounds kind of like robots. Let's play. So there I am. Boop. Did I die? So this is just like robots. Ooh. Oh no, I'm bad at robots. Ah! I guess I misjudged how far the Moe's move. Jump. Oh man, this is a little bit too small for a robot's grid and they don't advance when you jump. That's good to know. Okay, I, I can get behind a game like this. That is if this was a little bit bigger space. The So Robots is a Unix game. Actually, I don't know the origin of it. I know it shows up on Unix terminals. It's text mode where you run away from robots. Um, and this game seems very, very similar to that. Um, in Robots... I know the goal is more to get the robots to run into each other and die. Oh, damn it, I made a mistake. I'm going to win this game because I think I can? Anyway. Ah, apparently I can't. I'd be curious... So I don't know how much influence there was um, from Unix on Play-Doh systems. They're... I don't want to say contemporary... It's, it's weird. So Unix really starts mattering in, ah, I died again. Um, 1969 Unix epoch, whatever. That's about when consensus is Unix starts to really matter. Um, but versions of Unix don't get out into the wild until later. So I'd be curious if there was actually some kind of Unix influence on Plato, I know the mainframe, so all the software stack for Plato's custom. Um, so they, they aren't running Unix, but I'd be curious if they knew of, if the developers knew of Unix. They, they had to have. Ah, man, I keep making that mistake, misjudging the grid. Jump. Man, I, I'm walking away with more questions than answers. But Bees, though. Bees is a good video game. I, I know that much. Um, yeah, I am really curious about the Unix connection now. I should make a note of that. God, I know I can win this game. I've won robots before. It's not an often or a regular occurrence, but... I have won a handful of games. Okay. I'm gonna go over here and jump. Oh, I gotta jump. Oh, oh no. Okay, next. You know what, I, I'm, I'm friends, or not friends, Brian Deere and I follow each other, the guy who wrote The Friendly Orange Glow. I should see, I should ask him about Plato and Unix, because if anyone knows, it would be him. Since, like I was saying, The Friendly Orange Glow is basically, oh man, so close, um, the book on Plato. So, he'd be the one who would know if there's a Unix connection at all i feel like there's gotta be right like at least some like i was saying they're on their own stack so it won't be a lot and actually i don't know if the they're running a cyber mainframe from cdc so i don't know if that even ran unix especially since 
Okay, so C comes out in the very, very early 70s. Something you might not know is Unix was originally written in assembly language. So there's a chance, or that's not what I'm getting at. Unix was originally an assembly language, which means that it wasn't actually portable for a while. Um, once the C implementation comes online, it starts getting ported, but there's not a whole lot of porting going on until much later. So I'm pretty sure the cyber during its lifetime didn't run Unix at all. Um, but that, of course, doesn't preclude people on the Play-Doh team from knowing about Unix. You can know about something without running it. Oh man, I don't like the random jump killing me. So close, I know I can win. <coughs> Excuse me. And I lost. Well, apparently I don't know I can win. Oh, why am I ranting about Unix during a friendly game of robots? Okay, this is, I will give this game my seal of approval for whatever that's worth. This is actually fun enough to keep playing. Oh man. It feels risky. It feels dangerous. All the hallmarks of a video game. Gotta jump. Oh, 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 jump. Okay, a few of those died. Jump. Okay, here we go. Jump. Jump. I might be, this might be the game I finally win. Or not. One way to find out. I guess I should be less pessimistic, but these video games are hard. And I'm normally not that good at video games to begin with. There's a reason I have a podcast about computer history and not video game history. Video games are interesting and all, but my passion is mainly computing. Oh, here we go. Here we go. It's just down to the two robots. Oh, this is going to be hard. Uh, okay, that one goes there. Okay, and luckily you can jump faster than the robots move. That's interesting because the robots move on a three second timer. There we go. One win out of 19 games. Well, I've conquered that challenge, so with that, let's, I think we have time for one more game, and then I'm going to call it good and go ask Brian Deere some questions, um, or tweet at Brian Deere and see if he'll answer my Unix ramblings. Deutsch? Darts? D-darts? Let's see. Conquest. Let's try that. That sounds like a fancy game. You're currently the only player. Okay, another MMO thing. Press next. Oh, data, select a universe. Universe one. Let's be the Archons. Oh, capital A. Oh, is this, this looks like an extension on um, Empire. So that's, let's not do that. Like I was saying, that's one of the games where you kind of need the MMO aspect for it to be fun. Let's do D&D. That sounds easy. Cause you know, D&D, easiest game possible. Main D&D menu. My upper note file, back to exit. 
how do I play it? Loading monsters. Okay. Next to enter Wizard World. That looks good enough to me. Wizard of Hass. The secret name is Sean. <laughs> hey, here's a top down. I died instantly. Well, no one get my save file, I guess. D&D. So yeah, as you can tell, this appears to be another game where I'm just going to die a lot. The other interesting thing about the password um, is it actually echoes more times than you type. So it's not like Unix passwords where it just doesn't echo. Oh, this must be arrow keys. Found gold, found gold. Found a lot of gold. Oh. Evade. Next to fight. Did I die again? I did. Oh man, this is awful. <laughs> I get the fun aspect. help through doors I have to capital okay that's kind of annoying found gold found gold specter let's magic it fireball hey that actually worked all right I like this game now because I'm not dead magic oh okay Magic. Yeah, magic. I cut it up. Look at that. I am become death, I guess. Oh, a ghoul? Let's fight it. No, I'm dead. All right. Well, I think that that does it for D&D &D because I am dead <laughs> again. Okay, what else is on here that looks fun? Dogfight. I think that might be one of the flight simulators that I've read about. Number 40. Oh, Sean. They call me Sean. Um, statistics. Can I just run it? Available zero, zero. Oh, man. That's an MMO. Or a... That's a competition game, so I can't play that without a friend. I should trick some of my friends into signing up for this. Or Empire Football Fish War. All right, that sounds zany and fun. Let's play some Fish War. Catching Fish. Internal Air War? What is this? Sean. Can't accept a game and play. Nice. All right. So that's another big board game, which is the ones that you play with other folk. Games. What? Let's just play games. That's nice and generic. Oh. I should have guessed that. How about Madness? That, I think Madness might be a good one to end on if it's actually something. The idea of this game is to wager money and beat the house in a simple percentile roll of the dice. What? Okay. Let's play Madness. I'll wager 50 smackaroons. 
ten dollars. Oh. Ten dollars. Oh. This is just a slot machine. I don't understand this game. This is literally random chance. This... I mean, people do play slots, so I guess it makes sense that this would also be on Play-Doh. Yeah, I'm not going to win that. I don't understand why someone would play this game when there's so many other options on the mainframe. Let's call that good. Come on, there has to be a cooler game than a slot machine. But I guess it makes sense that it would be on here. Let's try darts. What in the world can this be? No. Maybe this teaches darts? I mean, that would make sense because it is a lesson thing. Next to play. What in the world? Shoot a dart at two. Shoot a dart at 1.8. Oh, this is a number line game. All right, I got the hang of it now. A, okay. So that's an actual lesson in the guise of a game. Oh, Mahjong. Mahjong sounds nice and relaxing. Let's play two Mahjong. Let's see, star is condensed at your sight. I don't know what that means. Let's just play Mahjong. Press lab to see, I wanna see the dragon. Hey, it did exactly what I asked for. I like that. All right. Oh, no, that, oof. Oh, man. Okay. I want to try Mahjong. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep trying this until Mahjong works. Darn it. It says it has a mouse or a simulation. So... As to the PC care set. What's interesting about Play-Doh is they actually had a touch screen implemented. Um, hey, Brian Deere was the last winner. So it would make sense um, if they had mouse simulation because the touch screen they used was infrared, so it had a grid. Yeah, this is just Mahjong. I'm actually down to play some Mahjong right now. Press next to remove the tiles. Um, I like Mahjong. It's relaxing. It's calming. And it kind of beats losing at D&D &D over again. That's interesting, though, that it doesn't auto-advance. Okay. Do, 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 ba, do. If there's some pro strat for Mahjong, I don't know it. I'm not that smart when it comes to these kinds of games. I just like clicking stuff. Hmm. I wonder what help does. I'm actually, okay, help does nothing. Makes sense. Oh, oh cool, there's a, I didn't notice that was an actual thing. Replant, new game, help, lesson, index, save game. Oh, so you can save, that's cool. Shift help is peak. What's that do? Oh, okay. Touch a tile. This is I this is like the robots game. I like this. I'm not good at it. Tile is not free. I saw one of these. It must have been there. 
Well, this is probably boring for anyone else besides me to watch. So I think this will do it for the stream. And this is a good place to end. The graphics for this are fantastic. It shows the touch screen and it's an actual playable video game that we have modern counterparts for. So yeah, this is Plato. If you want to learn more about the history of Plato, I'd highly recommend The Friendly Orange Glow by Brian Deere, the also the reigning champion of Plato Mahjong on this server, apparently. And I'd also recommend going out, and if you're a little tech savvy and want to try it out, getting an account over at Cyber One. The people there are doing great work preserving this part of computer heritage. And if you want to hear more of my ramblings, I host a podcast. It's called Advent of Computing. You can find everything about it at adventofcomputing.com or just listen to it anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Well, I'm going to sign off and keep playing Mahjong. So have a great rest of your day.